Persian history. Um, I, for one, am feeling very envious of your adventures in Iran. So um, they very kindly agreed to take questions um, from the audience. Question coming out just from Ignorance for the Net. Uh, have there been paleobotanical investigations of the gardens to know which trees exactly were planted? Because I remember listening to a lecture of, uh, about uh, an apadana in actual Azerbaijan, which is very complicated because then it probably means that not only the kings had the right to have apadanas, because no king is a present there, and there, there were mostly peach trees. So I was wondering if it's no, we, only, we only know from um, various references in, in other things um, and from the relief set Persepolis. And in, in, in my view, I think this is very much my view, um, the reliefs at Persepolis do represent quite closely the gardens that were actually there. And there are cypress trees and there are palm trees. Um, but I think too that there was, there, we do know from, um, um, from Achaemenid inscriptions, although from slightly later than Cyrus period, which we don't really have inscriptions that early, that, um, that there was a, that, and, from, and from other sources, that part of the ideology of the whole thing was to bring trees from all over the empire, so that all the good things of the empire could be available to the king in his garden. So there would have been fruit trees, and it, it seems quite clear that there were fruit trees of all sorts, with date palms and all sorts of things, as well as flower beds and um, we have a lovely bit of um, it's Xenophon actually describing Cyrus the Younger laying out his trees in rows. So there were probably also sort of rows of trees, but whole mixtures of different kinds of gardens, I think, and different kinds of trees. But um, the, the sort of work they've been doing has been geophysics and looking at sort of the layout, sort of extending the range of the garden from just that small bit in the centre right out across that whole. Plain. So that, that's the sort of work that's been done. Could I add something there? Um, I think some work of this kind has been done at Persepolis, because I remember hearing a talk a few years ago which was called The Plant's Eye View of the Achaemenid Empire. Um, and this was one of those APA talks, which was just very, very short, but they certainly have done some investigation of, uh, of the plants that, that grew in, in some places, they're not in the And of course, Xerxes is said to have wanted to uh, conquer Athens because he was so keen on the Attic Phoenix. I think I'm right in saying that Xenophon is a great admirer of Cyrus, um, but when you look at the th something like this palace, I do wonder if he was as popular with his people as Tsar Nicholas II or Louis the Sixteenth. Um, <laughs> And I, I know Xenophon wasn't particularly a Democrat, but is there any evidence that uh, Cyrus was a particularly benevolent ruler or anything like that? The sort of evidence that people would use to make that kind of claim is things like the, the Cyrus Cylinder, which um, uh, talks about how Cyrus brings back the gods of, um, of the Babylonians to Babylon and We've also got biblical text where Cyrus is restoring, um, uh, restoring the temple in Jerusalem and allowing the, the Jews to return to Jerusalem. So there is that kind of religious tolerance and a propaganda that's associated with it. But it's, it's generally a Canaanid, um, my students have heard me on this before, um, a Canaanid policy is that um, what the Canaanid empire was largely about was money and finance and they pretty much left um, subject states to look after themselves both in religious terms and in political terms. So benevolence is probably not quite the right word, even though it can look like that when you sort of look at the Cyrus Cylinder, for example. Um, but it, it's more just letting, you know, they put an um, elaborate imperial structure in place, but then just you know, let people get on with it by and large. Um, they weren't really interested in, in interfering uh, I think you would you agree with me? Mm. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but, but that can look like benevolence and often is interpreted that way. But of course, there's the Xenophon that Cyrus knew was Cyrus the Younger, which is in the 4th century Cyrus rather than the 6th century one. But he, is, he does sort of extrapolate back from, from Cyrus to Cyrus. Yeah. I should say that Cyrus is still enormously important for the Iranians. 
our guide, who was very anti-Islamic, and clearly hark back to a pre-Islamic past, said, when we asked him, well, who, who are the two creators of the nation? He said, well, Cyrus and Ferdowsi, who was a 10th century poet who wrote the Shahnameh in Persian in early Islamic Iran. Shahnameh being Richard is an expert on it, the annals of the kings of Persia. So those were the two great founders of the Persian nation, the creators of the nation, Cyrus and Ferdowsi. So thinking about um, uh, Linas uh, Garden, which is both accessible and <coughs> inaccessible, but surely the absence of a, of a uh, defensive wall doesn't make it accessible. I mean, think of uh, the Genesis story. All you need is guards to keep people out. The equivalent of the angel with the flaming sword. <coughs> so I, I don't think one should necessarily think that the boundaries of the paradise are sort of all that permeable, even if there wasn't a wall there. Yes, but it's still, I think it's still playing to a certain extent with the idea, because there isn't, the thing is, there isn't, there very deliberately isn't a wall. Whereas if you go to somewhere like Persepolis, there is a, there is a boundary wall, and at Susa there's a boundary wall. And in other of these, you know, these Near Eastern palaces, there were very clearly boundary walls. And of course, you know, the, the whole thing is that you, you had to go through those gates. But, but even at Persepolis, um, and it was, you know, Persepolis was absolutely wonderful, but the, the, the gateway that one has to go through in order to enter the, the palace proper <coughs> isn't set within the wall. So again, you know, yes, you had to go through, one had to go through, but it's playing with the ideas of, 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 um, of you know, it's not part of, of the boundary, it, and it's actually set within it. But there's no way it could have avoided it. But it's, it's you know, there's, I think these ideological games and these games with protocol that one, you know, one had to, and it would have taken. It probably, well, Cyrus clearly did have a lot of um, soldiers available, but it would have taken an awful lot to, to, you know, that that's a very large space that we're we're talking about. I think it's two blocks long, from one end down to uh, Cyrus' tomb at the other. Um, another question about gardens, sorry. It clearly would take an enormous amount of work to get all of the stuff there and to maintain it as, um, as green as it would have to be for it to be an impressive sort of um, site. So what I was wondering is whether we have any attribution of that process to a human or a divine sort of character, and whether there's an official who is sort of the gardener, or whether the king is supposed to be a sort of symbolic gardener who maintains that greenery as well as um, sort of residing within it. The second it seems to be the case. Um, uh, when Xenophon talks about Cyrus, it's Cyrus as the gardener. So it's actually Cyrus planting the little trees in their rows. So. Um, but in terms of, sort of the, you know, there must have been whole teams of, of real gardeners, and there were the waterworks, the um, the dams in the hills behind, um, and the irrigation systems um, that, have, that have been you know, quite elaborate irrigation systems to bring the water in. It was, a, it was an enormous technological feat, apparently of a kind which is similar to a Babylonian rather than a Babylonian <coughs> way of doing things, because they weren't trying to go up into walls. On a plane, so it's, it's a gravity thing. But, but it's the the sense is, is the king is the gardener, and it's his garden. He resides in it, but he also he owns it. He plants it. Um, with the representation of Xerxes sort of seated on the throne with scepter and lotus flower, mm -hmm. would you say that there's any sort of connection to representations of, say, Panasic representations of Zeus? sat in the throne with Scepter and Thunderbolt, where the Thunderbolt sometimes takes a Lotus flower S form, or is there sort of any connection, <coughs> connection between those and the Zeus as it were? Well, I suppose it's uh, um, I mean, Hellenistic uh, coiners may have, may have seen these, these things. Um, 
I haven't really thought of a, a scepter or a thunderbolt looking much like a, a lotus flower, but I suppose it is possible. And I mean, if you have somebody in, uh, in royal state, what they tend to do is, is sit on their throne in a, in a dignified posture holding something. <laughs> 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 Um, I, I would not be surprised if there was any really direct influence from, from Persian sculpture onto, uh, onto Greek uh, moneying. But it is, of course, a very big question in general about whether um, how much influence there is of Persian art on Greek art of the 5th century and indeed vice versa. And there's some quite uh, big controversy to get underway about uh, the, uh, the Greek craftsmen who worked at uh, Asepolis and elsewhere and how influential they were on the actual development of the style um, with a, with a Persepolitan art is, is looking westwards or whether it's thoroughly near eastern and I think the art is somewhere in between and there, there is a bit of influence uh, going hither and thither but it is quite striking that if you look at the Western Empire more generally in Asia Minor you don't really find any attempt to replicate the, the Persepolitan the models, the models from the, from, from the core. You don't get that kind of art, Greek art in that, uh, in that part of the world looks very different, except in Lycia, where, uh, where you do get quite interesting represent, um, reproduction of um, audience scenes, uh, the, the lion bull, um, sculpture relief which I showed um, at Persepolis. It is copied um, on a tomb at Xanthus which I saw for the first time about 10 days ago. Um, <coughs> the style is uh, it's, not, it's exactly the same but it's just more green, softer, slightly more naturalistic um, but the model is obviously Persian. But that's really the only part of the, the Western Empire where you get a um, Influence, direct influence from the, the Persian core. Well, if there are no more questions, oh, just, just a very one quick question. question. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's probably questions. just a simple yes or no answer. <laughs> Is there any <laughs> correspondence between the god Mitra and Mithras? Yes. Also, also in Indian Sanskrit texts. Corresponding God of the Sanskrit text. And this is a common, from a common Indo European heritage. It's the same God. Elf, doesn't it? It's something like the Elf. elf. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's the same God, yes. So he's the, he's the God who represents the, uh, um, the, the, the binding relationship between God and man, as it were. In that case, we would really love it if you could join us for a wine reception over in the cafe um, here in the XFI building. Um, we would ask if you are able to make a donation to help cover the costs of that reception, if you could do so. We are a charitable organisation um, and ideally we want to plough our funds into supporting the language teaching programme in schools. Um, but before we do that, could we once again thank all three of our speakers, Richard and Richard and Lynette, for such a fascinating and rich talk. Thank you.